Hello again, Charlotte here. Now, one of the most important aspects of learning how to draw is then taking that next step to being able to draw items in real life, not just from a photograph. Now, I know that as you're looking at this video, it looks like a photograph because it's on a flat screen, but I'm just gonna demonstrate a few different techniques for how to translate a real three-dimensional image onto paper using the techniques that we've already learned. And you'll understand through this description of technique why it's been so important to learn to draw with a grid or to understand why those straight lines are so important. So here we have a setup of some relatively random still life objects of different sizes and shapes. And the first thing I want you to do, now of course we've got a still image here now while I've been talking, and the most important thing to do is just to look before you start with anything. Now, if you've done some of the previous exercises, you would have a good idea of what you should be looking for. Here's my hand coming in, but you know, the really dark areas of shadow, the straight edges of this box here, the side there, you see you start seeing those wonderful steps of negative space. You start noticing things like that. Now, the first thing I would do whenever I'm starting a, a drawing like this or a composition, I would take my pencil, which is the line coming in just over the top of the camera. I would close one eye when I'm looking at this. Now, of course, you don't need to do that when you're looking at the screen, but when you're looking at three-dimensional objects in real life, I mean, the reason you can see them as three-dimensional objects and perceive them as having depth, as having been understanding that you can put your hand behind them because you've got two eyes. Now, the two eyes, like 3D filming cameras, if you've ever seen behind the scenes of a 3D, 3D movie, they have two cameras next to each other. And, and it's almost to replicate eyes seeing in, in 3D. Now, if you close one eye, it straight away flattens the image and you lose some of the ability to understand depth, which is really, really helpful when you're when you're drawing. Some people find it quite hard to close one eye. Just w work out which one you see out of best because you need to always have the same eye closed when you're looking at a, a still life setup like this. And what I would do with one eye closed, I would just start to move my pencil down through the image. Now I would keep a horizontal, a really horizontal line, and I would start looking along the pencil and see, oh, look at that. The top of the red candle holder is directly in line with the neck of the vase there, or the decanter. And then I would move my pencil down and I would start looking all the way along this line. And now, if you think back to the grids, I mean, my pencil is basically creating a moving grid line, a horizontal line, where I'm just starting to see how everything relates. Now you see that line, the horizon line at the back. Now I look at that going all the way through and I notice what it connects to. Remember, you're not looking at the individual objects in isolation, you're looking at the entire composition, that jigsaw of light and shade. Whoops, just kicked the camera then. Now, the pencil coming all the way down, this just looking, the slowing down and looking, and you start to see like, oh, look, that shell is really close to the bottom of the decanter. And how do these, what is the lowest point of the composition, right? It's that front part of the shell. And even the, the folds in the fabric, they're really, really good jigsaw puzzle pieces, little road maps so you can help to join everything together through these folds. And then of course, I would create a vertical line with my pencil and I would do exactly the same thing. I would just with one eye closed, just starting to see how these objects relate, the context of them all, where these vertical lines link the different items together. Nothing is in isolation. There's always a context. So on this left-hand side, see how the, the left-hand edge 
of the black box goes right through the center of the apple stem there and the edge of the red vase the little um, cup there the candle holder where it comes down it's not quite in line with the edge of the black box but there's those two amazing clean crisp steps there with the background so you start seeing how everything joins together and that's really really important and the next phase would be to to just check if even if it's obvious which is the highest point of the composition well it's it's that that point there with the top of the decanter the lowest point is this shell nose down there furthest to the right the edge of the tomato sauce bottle furthest to the left the edge of the apple so you know the the box that this is all going to fit into and that can really help just to understand with your your paper how you're going to place it and also how you want to create the, the composition to start with now before even showing some some techniques for translating that onto your paper i'm going to suggest that if you're new to drawing or even if you're you've been doing it for a while but just struggling a little bit when you're wanting to do something real because it is quite different to copying from a photo because you're looking at something three-dimensional and you're, it's that additional element of psychology of your brain anticipating what it thinks is there rather than the artist's eye seeing what is really there. And remember that jigsaw of light and shade, which needs to already feel like it's two-dimensional and flat for you to be able to translate it onto paper. So one way to do that is to create a, a grid on acetate so this is just a piece of a4 acetate available from uh, any stationery shop and you can draw a grid on there and stick it to to um, large paint paint jars or anything which will hold it vertical and you see how instantly this gives a context which we're familiar with and what I would always suggest would be to make sure that you line one object up exactly with a corner of the grid. So let's look at that big round tomato bottle on the right hand side. Now if I line that up just there, so it sits in that bottom right hand square, then every single, oh, well obviously there's a little bit of wobble as I'm um, talking and uh, emoting and moving about a bit. But if you picture that it's stuck there, ding, then every time I go to draw another object, I would make sure that I'm aligned so the tomato is always sitting in that position. Because when you're drawing, you probably move around quite a lot, don't you? And that can mean that the, the grid appears to move in front of you, even if it's completely static then just your moving of the position will shift all of the objects around. And of course, that doesn't help at all. So you want to line up one object in a very clear right hand or right angled corner and make sure that before you start drawing any object, you're repositioning yourself right there in that same place. And then suddenly, of course, the context of this, much easier to understand because you can see how high the objects are. You can see in relation, I mean, all of the same, the reasons why we use grids over our drawings to start with, because it helps to understand the context and, and the nature of curves in all of those little negative spaces, especially around round objects. So you can absolutely do that, or you can get a little right angled corner like I, I showed you in one of the exercises now this is just a piece of mat board cut from a frame and this does exactly the same uh, job you can see in that corner there all of a sudden the curve of the tomato sauce bottle much easier to see in the context of a right angle and I can use that for all of the Whoops, I have a bit of trouble with my figuring out the camera and the angle of where these go. But C, being able to place it there, and that gives a very clear understanding of how the red 
uh, candle holder is directly related in a horizontal line. Ooh, if I could keep my hands steady. I'm just so enthusiastic. I'm moving all over the place. Uh, the, you can see how the top of the, the candle holder is directly in line with the, that edge of the decanter, which we noticed when we did the pencil line straight away. But when you look at those, the whole setup, you probably didn't notice that at the start. But it's really important to be able to see how these objects are linked, even though they're separate in this composition, they're completely together. Another really helpful tip, just get a large straight object like this, uh, or cylindrical, but straight sided object like this paint jar, paint tub. Now, if I put that on the left hand side and if I had another one on the right hand side as well, then that suddenly gives a very clear context of the edge of the picture and I can see the the curve of the apple remember how helpful it was having the grid over the apples for the apples and pears drawings at the start I can also see even more clearly these steps here but having that straight line there I can see how far in the candle holder is from the edge of the picture therefore how far away the edge of the apple is from the edge of the red candle holder. So having a, a straight line, which again is just like a grid line, but this is a, a, move, a movable object, having a line there at the sides of your, your whole composition, on the other side you could have another, another jar, or even if I hold a ruler up there, and that frames the whole composition and just helps you to see, again, the spaces, the space between the edge of the picture and the edge of the decanter, which can be quite a hard area to see when there's nothing there. It's always harder when there's a big gap, when there's loads of information, like round here, the jigsaw puzzle suddenly has lots of different pieces which fit together, these tiny little, little gaps. So those already three different ways that you can approach this. You can have a grid on acetate, which is, which is, I mean, you can do all of these things. You can have the grid, you can have the straight line at the side, you can use a right angle, you can even actually measure the whole composition. If I have the, the paint tub there, and I can then measure in from the side of that all the way over to the tomato and now I don't know whether you can see on the ruler, but the tomato is on 23 centimetres all the way across. So I know that the entire picture from the edge of the apple there, which is the furthest point to the left, all the way across is 23 centimetres that that width from my arm being straight out. And as you can see, if I move it slightly closer, of course, it appears to be smaller, closer to me. And if I move my arm further away, then the measurement is, is larger. So you have to make sure that you establish one measurement, like now it's on 24, isn't it? 24 wide, and I would make sure every time if I was going to use my ruler to measure anything else in this composition, I would reset at 24 wide from apple to tomato every time I wanted to, to do any measurements. And I could even then translate that directly onto my paper. So I could do a line which was 24 centimetres wide, and it keeps going back to 23, doesn't it, with the amount that I'm moving. And, and then... I could measure the height of it. So we know that the lowest point is the, the shell nose there and the highest point is the uh, top of the decanter. Now you see how I'm having to move the ruler over a little bit because there's um, a disconnect between those two spaces. So what you could do is you could lay down a flat edge there, just as we've got a line on the left hand side with the blue paint jar, if I create a horizontal line with a, with a piece of paper or a piece of card, then it's much easier, isn't it, for me to measure along here and up and I can see how high the decanter is 
so 21 centimeters. So I know that the, the width is 23 or 24, depending on where I am. And I need to make sure that I get that standard measurement there, yeah, 23. So 23 wide and 20, oh, there we go, it's 23 high as well. No, 22, 22 and a half high, something like that. Okay, so I can actually measure the whole composition and draw that size box, or I could double the measurements onto an A3 piece of paper. So I've got it very literally. I can then even, if you want to be that specific, you can measure every aspect. So you can measure how wide the apple is. You can measure how wide the box is. You can see it goes to nine centimeters, eight and a half centimeters wide from the edge of the blue to the right hand side, the right hand edge there. So you can measure every aspect. If you want to be really precise and really understand all of those, those measurements, you, you can all of that, all that context all of those spaces, or you can just look for a, a halfway point. So work out where the halfway line is and draw a line across your paper to give you a sense of halfway through the whole composition and start that way. Another way you can do that is to use your pencil to do proportional measuring. Now this can be a little bit tricky to start with until you really get the hang of it and and it, it can just so don't worry if it takes it takes you a few goes to wrap your head around the concept so what i would do i would pick one object that i can see really clearly preferably a straight line or a straight edge and i would use that as my measuring stick for the the whole composition so maybe it would be the top of the, the red jar there. And what I would do, I would hold my arm really straight out in front of me. I you see how I've got the point of the pencil on the left hand side, and I then slide my thumb to the to create the width of the jar there. Alright? And then I can turn my hand to create a vertical line with the pencil. And you see how where my thumb is? My thumb is just a little bit higher than the base of the jar, which means that the width, so the width is this measurement, that amount of the pencil. And here I can see, you have to make sure that you're getting a really good vertical line. I can see that the, the height of the jar is slightly more than the width of the jar. So I could use this measurement. I know that straight away that this is a rectangle and not a square, but I could use this to just work out. Oh, look at that. Isn't that amazing? Oh, in my enthusiasm, knocking the camera again. So the width of the jar there, if I always go back to this measurement, I would keep going back to this measurement, the width of that red candle holder there. Now, between, if I move the pencil tip over to the edge of the blue tub, now you see where my, th my thumb hasn't moved and that measurement of that amount of pencil is exactly the same, which means that this width here is the same as the space between the edge of the picture, the edge of the picture is all the way down the left hand side, furthest point to the left, which is the apple, that gap is the same width as the width of the red jar, okay? So straight away, I'm starting, actually, if you're looking at that from maybe the first time, I don't think that space looks as big as that, or maybe it actually looks bigger. It's, the mind plays really, really interesting tricks with perception, and that's why learning with, with a grid, learning how much our eye can deceive us with curves and understanding why that shadows and light that jigsaw can be very difficult to translate to start with because we're not used to having to break down what we're looking at into such simplistic shapes there's different meaning to each of the objects we're looking at there's different context to a, a setup and a composition we're not used to seeing 
negative spaces here as important. We're used to seeing the important bits of the objects themselves, which you would go out to to reach, to pick up, or that you know there's there's a reason why the brain is focusing on those. So as an artist, you need to learn how to break down all of that information and apply it into your to your drawing to really see what's there. So having established our the width that the width of this jar is the same as the space from the edge of the picture, then I can also turn my pencil vertically as I did as I did before. And I could say right from the edge of that uh, jar, how about I'm keeping my finger in the same, my thumb in the same position. Now from the top of the red jar, is it in fact, if I slide my hand, look at that, right to the top of the decanter. So the space above this red candle holder is exactly the same height as the width. I've been moving my hand around a bit too much. I've got to find that, find that little uh, measurement again. There we go. This space above the jar goes right to the top of the whole picture. So you see how now we're starting to build up different blocks of size, of comparative size, using that measurement to start with. And that's just using the pencil to start creating an understanding of how things fit together without having to look at numbers on the ruler or without having to create a grid. But I would always, whenever I'm drawing, I would always use my pencil as a vertical grid line, as a horizontal grid line, moving around the whole picture to check. So when I draw this apple and I check that I've got the, the edge of the black box coming right through the center of the, the stem, and I would check that the top of the apple comes, come on, Charlotte, horizontal line with your pencil. And I would check that the top of the apple goes all the way there. It matches up with the top of that tomato sauce bottle. So you start seeing how everything joins together. You want to make sure that this part of the picture matches up with the left hand side and that this shell down here is positioned perfectly in relation to the decanter and that everything matches together as a jigsaw. Remember, it's a jigsaw of light and shade. Everything fits together beautifully. So let's just move that out of the way. So you can see now how you're probably looking at this in quite a different way. And again, if you want to try drawing this in any of the, the media we've practiced, so pencil, charcoal, white chalk, print off this picture, the high res reference image will be on my website. And you can then do your own still life setup. And what I would recommend will be to take a photograph of the still life setup as well. So if you are having trouble, then you can, you can draw lines across your photograph, or you can put a grid over the photo on your device, but just some way of double checking that when you're translating this in real life onto paper, that you are really understanding all of these spaces and how it fits together. And then it just takes a lot of practice and being able to see all of these spaces and remember the importance of the shadows, just as important as the objects themselves, because they describe the light source, they describe the shape and nature of the objects to our eye so we understand that they are three-dimensional. And all of the lines, even the, you know, the crease in the, the back of the cloth there, the, uh, the curve through here, any of those lines, they help to join the picture together. Really important to see everything as a whole. So you can definitely have a go at drawing this specific composition because there's so many different textures and shapes in there. Really interesting light across here. Look at that fantastic light and of course through the decanter with the, the amazing variation of, 
of the, the, the horizon line there, just beautiful to draw with all of that brightness. And if you are looking for your lightest, darkest, and everything in between shades, of course, you've got your brightest, which is the white, of the shines of the decanter, the shine on the sauce bottle, the white of these shells, the shine on the apple, they would all be white paper. And then the really dark shape here, some of the dark areas in between all of the cloth, they would be your, your blackest, darkest areas of, of shadow. Okay, now lots and lots of different ideas to digest there. The most important thing is you working out which of those methods works for you. And I guarantee that just with a bit of practice and a lot of looking at what's there, not what you think is there, more and more of that will help you to be able to translate real three-dimensional still life setups or portraits or whatever you want to do. But it's always remembering those key factors of the lightest, darkest, everything in between tones, your jigsaw of light and shade, and just remembering how everything fits together and how helpful it is having straight lines to help you see curves. Okay, now have fun with it. Bye.